What is going on folks? I'm Des with DesFit and this is the brand new Casio G-Shock GSW H1000, which is the first G-Shock to run Wear OS, which allows Casio to just roll in a whole bunch of smartwatch functionality into their legendary line of G-Shock watches without them having to recreate everything from scratch. But there are some downsides to Wear OS that we'll get to in this video. So in this video, we'll talk about all the features this device has to offer. We'll go over the unboxing and setup experience. We'll obviously take a really up close look at it. And I'll also give a tour of the interface just to give you a good idea of what this device is all about and I already have taken on its first bike ride so I do have some results to share in terms of GPS and hardware accuracy but I'm still calling this just a first impressions video and not a review just because I like to test these sort of devices really thoroughly for a bunch of different activities so I'll have a full in-depth review of this device that'll come out in a couple weeks when I've had an opportunity to test it for more activities like running weight training swimming as well as even more cycling so make sure to subscribe to get a notification when that video comes out and if you are a G-Shock fan I already do have a really in-depth review of the GBD H1000 that I'll have linked down in the description below, which will give you an idea of the level of detail I like to go into. Okay, so first things first, let's go ahead and get this thing unboxed and set up. So on the box, here's where we can see that the GSW H1000 runs Wear OS by Google. And on the back of the box, it highlights some of the features like its shock resistance, the fact that it has a heart rate sensor, GPS and altimeter barometer, compass, and that it's water resistant down to 200 meters. Oh, and it also does come with an accelerometer, gyroscope, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, as well as a microphone for Google Assistant. Inside the box, we've got the watch itself, and then it comes with a charging cable and a manual, and that's it for everything inside the box. To get it set up, you'll pair this up with the Wear OS app, and you can do this either on an Android phone or an iPhone, and the setup process is very straightforward, where you just follow along a couple steps, and it's pretty quick to set up, and it only took me about 10 minutes. For the hardware, G-Shock watches obviously have a pretty distinctive look to them, but a lot of that design lends to their extreme durability, so the blocks and the texture are designed to help to protect the display as well as the buttons. It has a metal bezel, and then the buttons are going to be made out of aluminum, and then this middle button right here has a pretty aggressive texture to it. Um, on the left-hand side of the device, there aren't any buttons, however, there is the charging port for the magnetic charging cable that just goes in just like that. So it comes in three color options. There's an all black version, a red version, as well as this blue and black version that I have right here. So there's nice color accents like on the start button right here, as well as on the strap, as well as these little wedges on the underside of the strap, which help keep the watch more secure on the wrist. The strap is super long, so it should fit a variety of wrist sizes, but it's not terribly soft and it's not really that flexible. It's not uncomfortable to wear, but it's definitely not the most comfortable strap I've worn. There are, however, these little blue wedges in between the case and the strap, which help keep the watch more secure in the wrist. And I do think that these work, considering the time I spent with the GBD H1000, which has similar wedges, although the wedges are designed just a little bit differently on these. And then on the back of the device, there's this really gorgeous titanium backplate that surrounds the optical heart rate sensor. Of course, this isn't a small watch by any means, and this is what it looks like on my 187 millimeter circumference wrist. And then here's where you can sort of see how those blue wedges work. Watches of this size and weight are interesting for sports and fitness just because larger and heavier watches do have a tendency of bouncing around the wrist a little bit more, which can have an effect on hard rate accuracy. But even though this watch is large and not small, it surprisingly does stay very secure on the wrist, and we'll check out those results for hard rate accuracy here in just one bit. Oh, and before we check out the interface, if you are finding the information in this video useful, really quick, just go ahead and hit that like button down below. It's a small little thing that you can do that'll help this video and the channel out a lot quite a bit, and I appreciate it. So the display is pretty interesting on this watch. So this is a 1.2 inch dual layer display where there's a monochrome always on display on the outside. And then underneath that, there's a full color display that 360 by 360 pixels that you'll activate. So the reason they did that is to conserve on battery life because these sorts of full color displays are great to look at, but they do consume a good amount of battery. Plus Wear OS is a bit notorious for being a bit of a battery hog. And you'll wake up the display either by tapping it like I was just doing right there, or you can use a raised awake gesture like I have right there. But you'll notice that it does turn off rather quickly, again, to conserve on battery life. For the always on display, it'll show your heart rate as well as the day, the time, as well as the seconds, as well as your calories burned. And the always on display is pretty readable in most conditions, but on some angles, there can be just a little bit of a glare that you can see right there. The main watch face, it shows your heart rate up top, shows your steps for the day, the time, as well as the seconds, and then your activity history over the week, as well as your calories burned. And you can see it just turns off within like a few seconds. And then if we swipe to the right, right there, it has Google Assistant, as well as a snapshot for the day. And then if we swipe to the left, these are going to be the tiles with Wear OS. So there's a weather tile. And you can see that the touchscreen is pretty responsive for the most part. It's pretty predictable and I haven't really had many issues with it. 
And then if we swipe down from the top, these are gonna be these settings. So here's where you can adjust your display settings like brightness. And there's also airplane mode. And then it'll also show your battery percentage right there. And then if you swipe up from the bottom, these will be your notifications. So there's a few different watch faces to choose from. So there's this digital watch face, there's this one called two layers, and then there's also the stock of Google watch face. And then you can add more watch faces through the Google Play Store. So with this digital watch face, you can actually customize the data that's being displayed. So there's three sections right here. If we click on this top section, here's where we can toggle through different types of displays like battery level, sunrise and sunset times, heart rate, barometer. Pretty good amount of customization there. And then with this middle one, go ahead and click that. Here's the current time with the world clock, just the clock, heart rate, calories burned. So we'll go back to the current time with the world clock. And then down here, calories burned, heart rate. So yeah, you can customize that data layout depending on what you wanna see there, which is kind of nice. Pretty nice. So getting around the device is gonna be a little bit interesting though, since it has both Wear OS as well as the base operating system. So to access the base operating system, we'll press this lower right-hand button, which brings up this menu right here. So you can toggle through the different functions just by pressing that button. Well, what's interesting is that you can also swipe around uh, the inside of the bezel to change those functions. So let's go ahead and check out some of these functions right here. So this one's gonna be activity. So this is gonna be start new activity as well as seeing the activity list. If we press this little icon down here, we can see the full activity list. So what you'll notice is that this activity list, it's mostly outdoor activities that you see right here. However, there's this one activity they call just workouts. And this is where you're gonna access your indoor workout activities like treadmill, uh, elliptical, arm curls. There's all these sorts of indoor workouts right here. And then while we're here, let's go ahead and check out what the data screens look like. So for running, if we go ahead and start this. Obviously we don't have GPS, so we're just gonna go and start this since we're indoors. So this data display will show your pace information up top, heart rate, as well as the time down here. And then for cycling, this is gonna be a little bit different where if we choose this, this shows your distance, speed, and then the time down here. So different data displays for different profiles, which I think is kind of cool. And then to stop the workout, you just press the upper right-hand button, and then you just hold down this little stop icon Boom, there you go, you can save it or discard it. But let's get back to these system apps right here. So here's where you can see your workout history. Then there's gonna be, you can change your watch face background. So there's gonna be a few different backgrounds you can choose from. So I chose this map black one. Kind of automatically chooses it there, kind of weird. But there's a few different ones to choose from like octagon, camouflage stuff like that. Let's go ahead and go back to this theme color here though. So we choose this, this is where you can choose your theme color. So if we choose red right here, it changes kind of everything to this more red hue. And then you'll see the highlights in red right there. Here's where we can check out the map since it does have full mapping on it. So it loads up the map pretty quickly and it's also pretty responsive on the display here. So too, and it does show quite a bit of detail. And the next one's gonna be your heart rate graph. I'm not sure, sure why it's actually showing my heart rate right there, but it'll show your heart rate over time. And then this is the timepiece mode. And this is gonna be a pretty interesting mode right here. So if we click this, what this does is it exits Wear OS and then performs just basically, it's essentially just a watch at this point. So I'll go ahead and show you what this looks like. So it actually powers down the watch. This takes a few seconds. And then it just goes to this screen right here. Now, the touchscreen doesn't work. None of these buttons really work. It's just basically a watch at this point. And this is where you're supposed to get up to 30 days of battery life. And this is probably a good time to bring up battery life. So battery life using Wear OS, you're only supposed to get up to about a day and a half out of it. And I've had this watch for about 24 hours by now. And the good news and bad news is that it's right around a day and a half. Now for G-Shock owners, that battery life is definitely gonna be disappointing. But for smartwatch owners, let's say if compared to an Apple watch, that is about the same. But like I said, everything is disabled at this point. So Wear OS is off. So if we go ahead and press this button, Button right here. It'll actually turn the unit completely back on, or at least turn the Wear OS portion of the watch back on. And the startup procedure, it's fairly quick for the most part. I think it takes about maybe 30 to 45 seconds. It's really not too bad. Boom, we're on again. 
The next system app is gonna be Tidegraph. And since I live in Colorado, this is actually gonna show the information in San Francisco right here. This is gonna be the altimeter. And by the way, I do live right around 5,000 feet. So the altimeter has been pretty spot on for me. And again, you can see your altimeter information over time right there. And you can actually see this uh, information from the ride that I did yesterday. Little spike right there, that is correct. There's also gonna be a barometer, compass, and then back to the activity list. And then to access Wear OS, so we'll just press this little back icon right there. To access Wear OS, we'll press this middle right-hand button right here. And this brings up the Wear OS app. So these are all the stock apps basically that were loaded, um, including a lot of the Google Fit apps as well. And then the only other app that I loaded onto the watch is gonna be Strava. And then this upper right-hand button right here, this is gonna be a quick shortcut to the activity. So you just start your activity. So if we press this, this will just bring up the activities like we saw before. And this is probably a good segue to talk about that bike ride that I did yesterday and talk about the GPS and heart rate performance. So I actually didn't use the stock workout app just because the accompanying smartphone app that collects all that data isn't quite ready yet. So what I did instead is I used the Strava app that I downloaded from the Google Play Store, which uses all the same sensors. So the screenshot on the left is from the GSW H1000 using the Strava app. And then the other screenshots are from some other devices I used as references, like the Phoenix 6 Pro Solar, as well as a couple of bike computers. And the total distance was right in line with the other devices, as well as the elevation gain. For the finer detail of the actual GPS tracks, these are very respectable results. The GSW H1000 is in orange, and it matched up nearly perfectly with all the other devices. So you can see it did really well. There was one spot at the beginning of my ride where it did overshoot the corner just slightly. And then in the lower portion of the map, there were two corners where it was a little bit off, but these were the only areas I found on the entire ride where it deviated. And those were very minor hiccups. And then for heart rate accuracy, I was pleasantly surprised to see these results for a watch of this size and weight. There was a portion at the beginning where it took about a minute to lock on a heart rate, and then it tracked along fairly well for most of the ride. There were portions like here and here where it wandered, and then it had a dip here, here, and here. But in general, these are not bad results at all. So for at least that first ride using the Strava app, those were very respectable results for GPS and pretty acceptable results for the heart rate as well. And then for battery life, when I left for the ride, I had 70% of the battery. And then when I got back, it had 53%. So it used 17% for an hour and 20 minute bike ride. And if we do the math, that means it was using about 12.75% of the battery per hour, which means that we can get almost eight hours of GPS recording time. However, that was using the Strava app via Wear OS. So I will be really interested to see the battery life results using the stock workout app. Okay, so now let's talk about price. So this bad boy comes in at $699, which is to say it's not cheap. However, it's built extremely well and does have that legendary G-Shock toughness. And it does have a lot more features than the GBD H1000 that I have over here. However, the GBD H1000 does have some insane battery life. In fact, I can't even remember the last time I've charged this and it still has like two bars left. I mean, it literally has been months since I've charged this watch. Oh, and while we're talking about some other watches, let's also go ahead and do some quick size and weight comparisons. So we have the GSW H1000 right here. We're gonna have this bad boy at 102.5 grams. Then we have the GBD H1000 right here, 100.4 grams. Here's the Sunto 9, 81.6. Then we have the Garmin Enduro Titanium version right here, 60.4. Chorus Vertex Icebreaker. 73.2, Phoenix 6 Sapphire, and this is the mid-size model, 84 grams. The Amazfit T-Rex Pro, 59.3 grams. And then finally, the Instinct Solar at 53.5 grams. And then for size comparison, this is gonna be the GBD H1000 over here and the GSW H1000 over here. And these are gonna be nearly identical. I can't really tell much of a difference at all between these two devices. And then here's the Sunto 9 on the left. So this is gonna be pretty similar in terms of the case diameter. However, the GSW is going to be a bit thicker. Here's the Garmin Enduro. And again, the case diameter is pretty similar on these two right here, but there's gonna be a pretty big difference between the thickness. Here's the midsize Phoenix 6 model. So this is not the X, this is not the S, but this is just the midsize 6 right here. And then here's the Chorus Vertex. And then this is the Amazfit T-Rex Pro. And then finally the Garmin Instinct Solar. 
So what are my first impressions of this device so far? Well, I'm pleased with what I'm seeing out of the GPS and heart rate performance, at least using the Strava app. It's built extremely well. It definitely has that distinctive G-Shock look, and I can't imagine it's gonna be anything less than super durable. And I do think that they implemented that dual display technology pretty well, and that color display is really gorgeous and nice and responsive for the touchscreen. I think the two factors are gonna be Wear OS as well as the battery life. So Wear OS, it definitely gets mixed reviews. And then the battery life, that's gonna be a concern, especially for G-Shock owners that are used to much longer battery life but in the smartwatch world of things a day and a half is going to be con comparable to something like an apple watch or a samsung but i don't think this watch is meant to sway people away from their apple watches or samsung watches this is just more adding smartwatch capabilities to their g-shock line of watches and i am really happy to see that there's a lot more activity profiles built into this watch than what we saw from the gbdh 1000. Anyhow, I've got lots more testing to do on this device, so I've got lots more information to share in the full in-depth review. So make sure to subscribe to get a notification when that video comes out in a couple of weeks. And if you liked the video or if you found the information in this video useful, don't be shy about hitting that like button down below. Thanks for watching and we will see you in the next video.